as we were yesterday. And uh, we were starting to describe how we would um, build a representation of rotations. And then we were going to talk about how do we build a representation of conformal um, now, we said the thing that we had written down was our commutation relations, and that was meant to be guiding us. So, the information that we use should really be just the commutation relations. Plus L M. 
everybody happy? I just did a little bit of algebra here. I took one third from the commutator onto the right hand side. What's nice about this now is LZ is the state to give me M. Uh, we left L plus onto the ket, but this term over here is just L plus onto the ket. So I get M plus 1 L M. So this would look just like a creation operator in quantum field theory, a raising operator for monic oscillator. Here we've got a raising operator here for angular momentum. And you'll be seeing exactly the same structure coming from CFT. And what's driving it? That green box. The next thing that is important is if I want to write all of my states, so messing around with this algebra a little bit, I'm just going to write down the answer that you get. I'm not going to derive this. But messing around with this algebra, you can follow it. So if you want to state all of the states, we've got one state with m is equal to L, another state with m is equal to L minus 1, carry all the way on to a state of L minus L. If I want to stay, say, how is this state characterized? Well, this state is characterized by the fact that when I try to raise the z quantum number of that state, I get zero. And once I've got that state, this state over here can be written as L minus L L, and I can just keep applying L minus to get all of the states. So that in the end, to get this state over here, which is 2L plus 1, then it's down, it would be L minus 2L plus 1 on 2L L. If I apply L minus again, I'll get 0. And all of this follows from that algebra. So we've used nothing more than the algebra. So uh, what is interesting here is we needed one state. There it is. Everything is written in terms of that one state. And uh, to fill out the rest of the states in this angular momentum multiple, we just took this L minus and we kept applying it. Now we want to see exactly the same structure coming out of CFT. So yesterday, we got to the point where we had the conformal algebra. So let me just remind you of um, the, the, the important features. Okay. So first of all, so conformal rate. Well, this is the when we looked at the Cartan subalgebra, <coughs> we said D was an element of the Cartan subalgebra, and we also said some of the M, some of these were an element of the Cartan subalgebra. We had to pick some M's that commuted. And I gave you two if we're working in D is equal to 3 plus 1, four dimensions. I gave you two M's that we should use. And the two M's that we should use are M12 plus or minus I M03. And uh, you have the algebra. You can check that these three objects all commute amongst each other. And the next thing that you would like to check is you can't find the fourth object out of the algebra that you commute to all three. This is the maximum that you can commute. Uh, good. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to label our states by the eigenvalues of these three operators. In exactly the same way that for angular momentum, we labeled our states. You can see L is a, is, a, is a label shared by all states. The label that characterizes different states is the second label, which is M. So M labels the states. Here, it is the eigenvalues of D. And M12 plus or minus I M03 that will label the different states in the representation. So we're interested in the eigenvalues of D, for example. Now, uh, here is the important equation to bear in mind. D comma E mu is equal to minus I mu. So you can see, take a look at the structure. Lz comma 
Raising lowering equals raising lowering. D comma P mu equals P mu. The other relation of the type that we learned for us is D comma K mu is equal to I K mu. So the generator of momentum of translations and the generator of special conformal translations are going to be the things that raise and lower the value of D and that move us between different states inside the representation in exactly the same way that L plus and L minus moved us between different states in the representation. Um, there's another thing that I'm going to start freely using in CFT, which is something called the state operator correspondence. I'm just going to state it and uh, then happily go here and use it. So, um, the state operator correspondence says the following. So, each state in your Hilbert space corresponds to a unique local operator and I'm just going to say conversely. So for every local operator we have a state. So if we were working in terms of states, we might take a state O, and uh, if O has a certain eigenvalue for the denotation operator, I would write D is equal to minus I delta O. Now let's take, for example, D acting on E mu O. Now, D acting on P mu O, I use this commentator here. This will be P mu D minus I P mu on the state O. And D acting on O is minus I delta. So I'm going to put the minus I out. I'll have a one left there. Delta plus one P mu O. If you um, want to write this in terms of operators, how would D act on the operator? Not multiplication on the state, how would D act on the operator? Anyone remember from yesterday? Commutator. D O would be equal to minus I delta O. And you could check, for example, if you took D onto P mu O. So that's how we would act with P mu on O. This would give us minus I delta plus 1 O. Okay? And what we could do is we could keep applying P mu and we could go ahead and get more and more states inside our multiple. Uh, you can also check uh, an interesting fact, which is that k will lower the dimension. So, written in terms of operators d, if we allow k mu to act on o, this will give us minus i delta minus 1 on o. Okay. Here, 
we are going to write down a state of lowest dimension. And we're going to build our multiplet on the state of lowest dimension. So the state of lowest dimension That means you cannot lower the dimension further. K mu lowers the dimension. So this will be a state that is annihilated by the special performance definition. Written in terms of operators, that would be the statement. And the language that goes along with this is <coughs> that we talk about O, we say that O is a primary operator. The way that we label our representations is we label our representations in terms of the quantum numbers of the primary operator or I can equivalently think about states. So I might say state. Now, um, I'm not going to prove this. I'm just making this as a statement. If, you're, so, so if you've seen this before, great. If you haven't, please just accept my word for it. Um, if you work in four dimensions and you want to study the representation theory of the Lorentz group, it turns out that to study the representation theory of the Lorentz group, you really need to understand so, so Lorentz in three plus one dimensions is SO13. And to study the representation theory of this group, all you need to study is the representation theory of SU2 times SU2. And this is rotations times rotations. And these two quantum numbers, these two operators here, are both like the third component. So when we're talking about uh, our Z there, you could think about this as a, as a JZ or a J3. And we call one of them J3 left and the other one J3 right. Okay. And I'm going to start using things about rotations. I didn't prove this. If anybody would like to talk about this more during the tutorial, we can do. Okay? I'm not going to prove that now. That will take us too far afield. So the quantum numbers that we would specify here would be the dimension D acting on the state. Then it would be spin. Uh, let's call this J right and J left. Now, if you're working with spin zero, in fact, there will be one primary operator. If you have, say, spin one or spin two or something like that, there are many states inside this J bar, J left. And what will happen is all of those states together will form some Lorentz multiplet and all of those states will be annihilated by K. <coughs> all of them might have the same dimension. They all share the same dimension, so they will all be annihilated by K. In what we do, we are going to be most interested, on the blackboard, the tutorial will be a bit more dangerous, we'll be most interested in studying operators of the form delta naught naught. So let's just write down the form of our multiplet. And then um, I will tell you a little bit about. Uh, so I said at the beginning that we were trying to find some consistency conditions from symmetry that would allow us to do calculations without perturbation theory, without an algorithm, just based on symmetry. And I will show you in a moment one of those consistency conditions. Uh, okay. So let's 
So let's write our model to the power. one of the things that we are after. Okay. 
here is a check to see that you are awake. Uh, equation of motion for that action? This one. What's the equation of motion? Good. I'll take that. You are awake. <laughs> d mu d mu phi is equal to zero. Here, okay, I wanted to remind you of something, so let me just grab that. Remember yesterday we calculated what do the various generators of the performance symmetry look like, right? And uh, does everybody remember that um, k mu looked like 2i x mu x dot d minus i x squared d mu. Remember we said it looks like a local translation. Local because it's translated by x squared and it looks like a local scaling. Local because it's translated by 2x mu. Now if we take this operator k mu and we were to commute it with phi, what do we get? We get 2i x mu minus i x squared d mu acting on phi of x. What will we get if we take k mu acting on phi and then we evaluate things that phi is equal to zero? If you plug x as naught into this formula, what do you get? Zero, zero. So what can you tell me about phi of naught? Nerina, what can you tell me about five naught? Sorry? No, no, primary. Primary, good. You're also awake. <laughs> so phi of naught is a primary. It has delta is equal to one. And it has both spins, left spin, right spin, equal to zero. Now we get something interesting that happens for this free theory that can't happen for other theories. And it's the following. Um, if we were to take that free field and start to generate the multiplet, so let me write the state that corresponds to phi as just phi. That's the primary field. This is delta's one, j f is equal to naught is equal to j right. The first descendant I will take p mu and act on phi. Okay. For my next descendant, I will take p mu, p mu, act on phi. And so I will keep going. But there's something curious that you notice, and it's the following. If we take eta mu mu, p mu, p mu, and we act on phi, we call the state psi. Then in the tutorial, using nothing more than group theory, so the commutators that you have from the formal algebra, you will prove that psi, psi is equal to zero. But if the length of vector is zero, what is the vector? Zero. So this is an example of what's called a null state. And the reason why p mu, p mu acting on phi is naught is because of the equation of motion. d mu d mu phi is equal to zero. That's a manifestation of it. We won't use the equation of motion. We'll just use the conformal symmetry. This will follow from the commutators of the, the conformal symmetry. 
Uh, and, okay, good. So this is an example of what we call a null state. There's a second uh, multiple in this theory. Let me just mention it. This you would have said has got delta is equal to 2. This you would have said has got delta is equal to 3. There's another primary operator in the theory, which is 5q of naught. You can check it's a primary by the same argument that we used here. In fact, phi raised to any power it, uh, uh, is a primary. Phi to the n naught is a primary. The reason why I specifically focused on this primary is that it also has delta is equal to 3. So the same dimension as the dimension of our null state. Okay. Just want to point that out. At the moment, you might not be sure why. Now let me explain why. We are interested in an interacting theory. We want to, the free theory is very simple. We want to calculate things in an interacting theory. The interacting theory that we want to study is this one. So, this is our interacting CFT. It's defined in d dimensions. So we'll have an integral, s is equal to the integral d dx, and it looks like one half mu phi u phi minus one quarter g mu to the epsilon phi to the four. Now when we say we want to work in d dimensions, d doesn't even have to be an integer. We imagine that d is equal to four minus epsilon, and we treat epsilon as a small number. These epsilons are all the same. Mu is some mass scale that we put into the theory to keep the coupling G dimensionless. Now, one of the things that you can ask yourself in, uh, see it in a, any quantum field theory is how does the coupling <coughs> change? <coughs> to be a CFT, the coupling should not change as you change your scale. The thing that tells you how the coupling changes when you change your scale is known as the beta function. Now, in this, so, so I'm going to talk now about a CFT, which is called the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, and it comes about in a very specific way. So let's say uh, Wilson-Fisher fixed point. And you're balancing two things delicately. The one thing is the sign to the four interaction. If you calculate just the phi to the 4 interaction, contribution to the beta function, this phi to the 4 interaction tries to make the coupling constant smaller. So when you look at your beta function, you have to do a final diagram calculation to do this. The phi to the 4 contribution looks like 3 over 60 pi squared g squared. And this is trying to make your coupling weak. Because we are in just less than four dimensions, this effect of coupling g mu to the epsilon has got the scale of a mass. So just because of the dimensions that it has, as you flow to low energies, this will naturally become larger. And the amount by which it becomes larger depends on that number over there, epsilon. So you've got another term, minus epsilon g. This occurs because we're just less than four dimensions, the coupling picks up a positive mass scale. This occurs because of quantum corrections. For the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, you set this equal to naught, and you solve for the coupling that does that G star. That's what the Wilson-Fisher fixed point is. Now, let's study the equation of motion for the Wilson-Fisher fixed point.
the equation of motion for the will sufficient is point from that action. Nerina, I'll um, pick on you again. What's the equation of motion for this direction? D mu D mu. Sorry, wow, let me do that. <laughs> that, that. That answers for that. <laughs> Good, okay. Even with a little hurdle, perfect. Good. What does this tell you? Look, this equation of motion in the free theory told you you had a null state. No null state. Because now the mu phi, the mu phi is not zero. But what is it equal to? Phi cubed. Phi cubed used to be a primary operator with its own representation. Now it's not a primary. It's a descendant of phi. So you have, have to have some consistency condition. As you take the limit that epsilon goes to naught, the single long multiplet of the conformal group becomes this short multiplet plus this multiplet. And that condition that the group theory matches up is a consistency condition. And we're going to use that to calculate some interesting observables. Okay. So, so I hope that now you can see uh, part of the reason why the group theory is relevant and how it determines some of the dynamics. You see, the equations of motion are statements from the group theory. Yes, Narina? Can you please repeat that again? Sure. The equation of motion in the free theory told us that the conformal multiplet built on the field phi has a null state. Okay? In fact, you'll be able to prove that this is a null state. This will only be a null state, though, if delta for this is equal to 1. If delta is not 1, it won't be a null state. In this case here, you can see this multiplet, for sure this is not a null state. The mu, the mu phi is not 0. It's given by that. But look, this is phi cubed now. Before, phi cubed was a primary operator, and we would build a multiple based on that. But now you get phi cubed when you add with two derivatives of phi. But two derivatives of phi is a descendant of phi. So this now tells you that these two different multiplets of the conformal group of the free theory, as soon as you switch on the interaction, they combine to give you a multiple of the interacting theory. And the fact that that happens tells you information. You can extract knowledge from that. Or you can extract something from that. OK, good. OK, so uh, the next thing that we're going to have to deal with a little bit is characters. And we're going to use characters to work out how to take tensor products of representations. Um, so, OK, so the. All the students, your vacation is up. <laughs> Let's wake up now again, now that you're rested. Okay. Um, can I assume that everyone here knows what a tensor product is? Or should I say a few words about what a tensor product is? Say a few words? Okay, so, uh, you know, <coughs> what is the tensor product? It's a way of multiplying things. Okay, so, so let's, let's think about a vector space. We've got a vector space V1. We've got a second vector space V2. What kinds of things might we have? Well, in this vector space, we might have a basis. So let's say this has got a basis A. We might have a dimension. So the dimension would be equal to the number of elements on the basis, V1. Here we could have a basis i, a dimension d2. Uh, we could have an inner product. Let's assume we've got an orthonormal basis. And we might have a collection of operators. Let me call them O1, E1, X1. And when I say that I've got these operators, what I mean is 
I can tell you what are matrix elements. I know that information. And here I will have some O2, P2, X2, and I, O2, J, and so on. What we want to do is we want to define a product. So we're going to take the product of V1 with V2. It's going to give us a new space with a new basis. I want an inner product for that space. I want operators acting on that space. And the operators in that space I'm going to get by multiplying operators here with operators here, for example. Maybe there's other operators that I think of that are not that form. But if I want to define this, what kind of things could I get? And I'm going to specifically stress the things that we'll want to use. Um, Uh, let's say V1 times V2 will have a basis which we can write as O times I. Uh, we can talk about the dimension. This runs over D1 values, this runs over D2 values. So the dimension of this would be D1, D2. What's the inner product? A with I onto B with J. The states from space 1 talk to each other. The states from space 2 talk to each other. So we get a delta AB, delta IJ. If I want to take, for example, some matrix element A tensor I of O1, tensor O2 of B, uh, tensor J, this matrix element will be the matrix element of O1 times the matrix element of O2. Okay. And you could go ahead and check, do these satisfy the axioms? So, so if this satisfies the axioms of an inner product, does this satisfy the axiom of an inner product? If this satisfies the axiom of a vector space, does this? And you could check all of that. Okay. You could check that this really is a way of building a new vector space given two vector spaces. Now, here's a little question for you that will be useful for us when we calculate characters. And it's the following. Is everyone happy that if I want to calculate the trace of O1, this will be a sum of the A, A, O1, A. Okay, so, so I hope we're all happy with that. If you're not happy with that, come and talk to me in the tutorial. And then what I want you guys to prove is the trace of O1 times O2. So, direct product O2, what would you do? You would sandwich the bases on the outside, some of the complete bases, and this just gives you the trace of O1 times the trace of O2. Make sure you understand that. Just check time. I'm not going to derive that, so uh, come and talk to me in the tutorial this afternoon if uh, you can't see that. Okay? If that's not clear, come and talk to me. This, this you should be able to get applying what we said. Here. Now what I would like to do is introduce a character. So remember yesterday we introduced the idea of a generator. We said that, uh, for example, if we have a rotation about the x-axis to an angle theta, this is equal to one minus i of theta's small x epsilon one minus i epsilon the generator rotations about the x-axis. The finite version of this formula just tells you that r x hat theta is equal to e to the minus i theta l x. So if you want to get a third <coughs> element, all that you do is you exponentiate an element of the algebra. You'll take the commutation relations, you can solve for matrices that satisfy the commutation relations, 
They might be two by two, ten by ten, whatever by whatever. Plug them into this formula, and you'll get the representation of the group in that representation. What the character is defined by. The character, let's talk about rotations now. In representation now, for let's say group elements, I'm doing a rotation about the z-axis through an angle theta. This is defined to be equal to the trace of the group elements. That's the character. The or one of the important uses about characters, there's many ways of using them, but one of the most important uses is to figure out tensor products of representations. So if we want to take tensor products of rotations, we can use characters to work out uh, what representations would appear in a tensor product. Now, now, in the case of angular momentum, you probably did it without characters in your quantum mechanics course, and that was fine. When you come to a conformal group, you're not easily going to be able to to work out the same tensor products without characters. So characters are the simplest way of calculating tensor products. It's the way that we'll use. What I would like to do now, though, is to calculate the character of the rotation groups so that we get some experience with doing that, and then we'll calculate some characters of the performer. Okay. That's just a number, so I can pull it out of the sandwich, and then the sandwich is one. Um, so we'll get the sum from m is equal to minus l to l of e to the minus i m theta. Now, that is a um, geometric sum. So I don't want to insult you guys. I'm just going to write down the answer. So this is the sine of L plus one half theta over the sine of one half theta. So that's the character for rotations. Take it 
tensor product? Of angular momentum L1 with angular momentum L2. Can someone tell me what possible angular momentum you get on this side? Babalelo. Sleeping. Lower. Yeah, it's a from the zero to a long distance. Sleeping. <laughs> Layla. Sorry? Sleeping. Narina. The only difference of magnitude L minus 1, L1 minus L2, up to 1 plus 1. Good. Okay. So when Narina can't answer, everyone's sleeping and we stop. <laughs> now, what we want to really derive, we want to derive this formula now, but using characters. So let's see if we can do that. Um, So the first thing that I need to do, if I want to calculate the character chi of L1 times L2 is in head meter, I have to calculate the trace. And now I take the operator for L1 tensor operator for L2. But we said to calculate the trace of a tensor product, the trace of the tensor product is the product of the traces. as 1 over 2i e 
e to the i l1 plus a half theta minus e to the minus i l1 plus a half theta over sine one half theta. So I've just written out the sine in terms of exponentials. So multiplying that sine in terms of exponentials into the two sums, I get e to the i uh, one plus a half from that sum plus m. That's one something over. So this is from the sine of the l one over sine one half theta minus one two i sum from m is equal to minus l two. Minus i l1 plus a half minus m theta sine 1 half theta. That's just algebra from what I have heard here. Now, this term over here, notice I sum m from minus l2 to l2. So I can happily swap m to minus m and nothing changes. If I swap m to minus m, all that changes is that becomes a plus. Now we get 1 over 2 i sum m is equal to minus l2 to l2 e to the i l1 plus 1 half plus m theta minus e to minus i l1 plus 1 half plus m theta over the sine of one half theta. And if we now write this in terms of sines, this is just the sum from m is equal to minus L2 to L2 of the sine of L1 plus a half plus m theta over sine one half theta. But now you notice that every single term that appears here is a character. So in actual fact, what we have found is we have a sum. And the sum actually starts from L1 minus L2. And it goes to L1 plus L2. Of chi l of the what's that? Coordinates is in the end. So what we've shown is if you take l1 tensor l2, you get a sum of the l's from l1 minus l2 up to l1 plus l2. So that's the usual addition of angular momentum for quantum mechanics. We're done using characters. I think with characters it's a much easier derivation. And what you will see when we come to calculate characters of the conformal group, in fact, you will not easily be able to take tensor products any other way. So we will calculate uh, the character tomorrow for the free multiplet. So delta is equal to 1, spin naught, left spin naught, right spin naught. Once we've calculated that character, we will calculate um, what's the tensor product of 1 naught naught of 1 naught naught. For those of you who are interested in higher spin theories, that statement is called the Flato Fransdahl theorem. And what it tells you is if you build the product of two scalar fields, that's what it means to take the product of these two conformal uh, field theory uh, representations, you actually get the field content corresponding to the dual higher spin theory of gravity. So, so that's another group theoretic statement that's got a lot of physics in it. Okay. We just hit 12 o'clock, I think I should stop.